My name is Awari Hayenga from West Virginia University. I am joined today by Dr. Pablo Sanchez from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And today we will briefly discuss percutaneous and open techniques for tracheostomy during this SDS 8 and 8 production. The timing of tracheostomy is a common topic of discussion. Early is defined as between three to 10 days post intubation and late is defined as greater than 10 or greater than 14 days. The argument against early tracheostomy is that some patients may not ultimately require it. The major argument against a late tracheostomy is that prolonged endotracheal tube requirement leads to longer weaning time off the ventilator. Two randomized studies tackle this issue. The Italian randomized study in 2010, where 12 ICUs were evaluated over four years, all the tracheostomies were done percutaneously. ICU-free and ventilator-free days were higher in the early tracheostomy group, but tracheostomy was associated with an adverse event related to the procedure in over one third of the patients. There was no significant difference in 28 day survival. Trachman in the United Kingdom trial in 2013 was a multi-center trial in which 89% of the tracheostomies were done percutaneously. Tracheostomies were associated with 6.3 incidents of complications requiring intervention. The all-cause mortality at 30 days was not significantly different between the early versus late tracheostomy. Now, balancing the risks and benefits of tracheostomies, many argue that it is reasonable to wait at least 10 days to be certain that a patient has an ongoing need for mechanical ventilation. Today, many people are switching to the percutaneous technique for tracheostomies. The benefits of this technique include it is easier technically, it avoids high-risk transfers from the ICU. It is more cost-effective. It is associated with shorter waiting time. It is associated with less peristomal bleeding. But we must nevertheless remain adept at ca and capable of performing open tracheostomies. For there are certain circumstances when this is still required. For example, when anatomical landmarks are not palpable due to patient's habitus, or when the technique of choice is an emergency malignancy at the insertion and in the setting of a high innominate artery. I'm going to briefly describe some of the technical aspects when it comes to a percutaneous tracheostomy and open tracheostomy. I, would, I won't walk through every single thing, but through things that we believe are important we perform in either. So our approach to a percutaneous tracheostomy, either in the ICU or in the OR, is to start with a bronchoscopy to clean up the airway to be able to oxygenate the patient. Um, because we will not going to be using most likely a bobby or any kind of electrocautery. We can keep the FiO2 100% during all times. And once we know that the patient is hyperoxygenated, the first thing that we do in the direct vision with the bronchoscope is to walk out the endotracheal tube. I like, or I, my preference is to be able to see the subglottic space. I believe that this is when we know exactly which one is the first or second or the third ring. Another point, we just follow the, the regular Seldinger technique with a needle, a wire, and a sequence dilation until we're able to advance our cannula of desire. Once we uh, finish the, the procedure, we um, make sure that the cannula is in the correct space by finish a walking out, uh, out in the tracheal tube, and then we perform a new bronchoscopy through the cannula to make sure that there are no signs of injury or blood or clots that need to be um, cleaned it up. In regards of the open tracheostomy, the, the only considerations that we have, of course, we want the patient with some level of hyperextension of the neck, but not fully hyperextended. We don't want to change our, our anatomy significantly. We uh, do hyperoxygenate the patient but we're very careful after we make our incision on the tracheal dissection to alert the anesthesia team that uh, we're gonna be making a hole in the airway. Uh, many times we made these either with a blade or with the electrocautery. Once we make our, our stoma between the second and the third and the tracheal ring, we dilate the stoma, we ask anesthesia to uh, walk, in, walk out the tube, and once, um, you know, deflate the balloon and walk out the tube, and once we identify the tip of the tube, we advance a new cannula and, and finish the procedure again with a bronchoscopy to make sure the things are in place and the balloon is correctly positioned and, uh, and that there are no signs of bleeding or things or clots or mucus plugs that need to be cleaned up. 
some recommendations have come and some changes have uh, been put in place with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that this, led, this pandemic led to healthcare systems across the country and across the world to define what, what were the appropriate sequence of events or the timing or the best situations and, uh, in which these uh, procedures should be performed. And in the United States, American College of Chest Physicians defined uh, a sequence of um, points, eight, to be precisely uh, after an expert panel that defined that the need for tracheostomy to perform it is when prolonged ventilatory support was expected, uh, that either technique was recommended, the need for protection for the team, the need for a consistent team, and the need of course to uh, have a negative pressure room or a closed circuit at all times. These last two, have led to uh, some alternatives in time in terms to how to avoid aerosolization uh, of the airway. Uh, some teams are advocating for permissive apnea, some teams are recommending positive ventilation, and some teams have made modifications to the percutaneous uh, technique by advancing the bronchoscope parallel to the endotracheal tube and then executing the sequence of event of a percutaneous tracheostomy without the need of removing the tube until the last step when uh, the removal of the, when the advancement of the cannula tracheostomy is necessary. At the University of Pittsburgh, we try to follow the recommendations of the American college, uh, particularly by performing this um, uh, tracheostomy most of the time, I'll say 90% of the time, the percutaneous, uh, following the percutaneous technique uh, in an ICU or in a negative pressure room. When the patient has uh, a challenge anatomy is when we take these patients to the OR. And at that point, most of the time, we just follow a hybrid approach in which we made a surgical dissection until we identify the trachea and then under bronchoscopy and following the percutaneous technique, we finally advance our tracheostomy cannula. That has been uh, the most effective way to, uh, for us to perform it. I don't know what has been your experience at, in, in West Virginia, Warwick. We follow exactly the same format, Pablo. Uh, to add to that, we are very pro-early tracheostomy. We perform this before day four, typically on patients on ECMO particularly. And we believe the burden of bearer trauma from mechanical ventilation coupled with the potential for critical illness polyneuropathy serves as enough justification for early tracheostomy to speed recovery and enhance rehabilitation. Yeah, I will agree with all that. So in conclusion, we, we need to define today that either surgical approach is safe, although many, as you heard today, favor early and percutaneous tracheostomy. And for those that uh, are looking to expand on the subject or see more of the recommendations, the American College of Chest Physicians has a, uh, a very good sequence of recommendations. And with that, I would like to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Warwick. Yeah. And, and thank you for STS for organizing this. Indeed. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you very much.